Welcome to the new episode of All That Jazz. I'm your host, Matthias, and I have with me my friend, Luke Ford. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, Matthias. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. So you are um, Australian slash American. That's what it says on the Wikipedia, and you're author of five books. And you have an interesting background because you did blogging, and now you're, you're a writer, but also you are a regular man. So... Um, so let's go back to your um, to your, how it all started uh, in Australia. So uh, anybody that looks you up, you're one of my most well-known people on the podcast because you do have a Wikipedia page for what it's worth. And uh, <laughs> so because maybe partly because your father was also a very um, uh, known man, but also because of your work later on uh, as, as particularly blogging. So. Um, how was your, um, how did you grow up in Australia that maybe motivated you to become a writer later on? Yeah, I remember there was a time in second grade. So that's, that's when I entered school because my parents had the attitude you should enter school late. So I was about age eight, entered oh, wow. second grade. And we took this school trip out to a bridge, a uh, uh, small, small bridge across a creek. And uh, the teacher gave us an assignment of just uh, writing about what we were seeing in the creek. And so there were all these submerged logs uh, covered with moss. And, and so I just started jotting down observations. And when, when my teacher read, read my observations out loud, people were affected by them. And I thought, wow. And so from that day on, I knew that, that I had an ability with words and that I could affect people with Okay. I couldn't hear the last bit. I said that uh, from that day on, I knew that I, I had an ability with words and that I could affect people with the words that I chose. Right. So I've never, never doubted my ability to, to write and to use words to move people. Yeah. Isn't, isn't that strange that uh, sometimes what happens to us in childhood, like, do you think we get imprinted with certain thing? Or do you think we just pick it up? Like somebody says this and we instantly believe it. And then we just run with it. Right. But it, it helps if it's connected to reality. So I was gifted with words. It wasn't, it wasn't something that was disconnected from reality because yes. my father was gifted with words. My father did a, a PhD in rhetoric. He, he did another PhD in New Testament studies. My, but my father was a, a master rhetorician. And so I inherited those abilities. And so the, the incident in second grade uh, made it explicit. But I think I was, I was even, I was writing stories by, by this age as well. And, and my mother would type them up and she would share them with people at the college where we lived. So I was getting a lot of feedback on my writing at an early age. So you got also support from your mother uh, yes. for writing. How about uh, your dad? Uh, probably. I just don't remember what my, my father said, but uh, there, was, there was no doubt that I had verbal abilities. Mm. So um, growing up in a religious household and where, uh, where your father uh, is uh, well known for writing, uh, I guess, religious books, right? Yes. Um, how, how did that affect your view of religion? Well, at first I took it for granted that, that uh, our religion was the only true religion and that this was the the really the only way to lead a life. And I wanted to become a Christian missionary. And some of my friends also wanted to become Christian missionaries. So we talked about becoming Christian missionaries and I would sleep on the floor to prepare for becoming a Christian missionary. And so I, I took it for granted that this was the one true way. Until, until my father got uh, dismissed from the Seventh-day Adventist church in 1980 when I was 14. And under the pressure of this uh, theological controversy, for the first time, he bought a TV set. So he, he used it to relax, but it, for me, it just opened up this whole exciting world. And so when we moved out of the Seventh-day Adventist uh, church, there was this whole exciting world on, on TV that, that captivated me and grabbed increasing amounts of my attention. And so where your attention goes, that's where you go. And so my father formed his own Evangelical Christian Foundation and so we still went to church every week, but it was, it was the world that I saw on TV that became more and more important to me. So I wanted to be a, a sports reporter. 
I, I wanted to sleep with lots of beautiful women. Uh, I wanted to get out there and explore the secular world. So the, the attractions of TV and of radio became more and more important to me. And the, the religion in which I was raised steadily reduced in importance, particularly when we moved out. I, I, sorry, uh, Luke, I couldn't hear the last bit. The mic cut out. Some technical difficulties. Sorry about that. So we keep I think going. I'm back. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So when I was in the Seventh day Adventist community, it was tight knit, and all my friends were Seventh day Adventists. So that reinforced the religion. But after age 14, when we moved out of that tight knit community, then it opened up more space. And so I had increasing numbers of friends who weren't Seventh day Adventists. And I was increasingly watching TV, listening to the radio. And so I steadily you know, drifted out of a Seventh-day Adventist perspective on life. Mm. Do you think of being, uh, would you say you were kind of sheltered from the ordinary secular life till you were 14? Yes. So I only went to Seventh-day Adventist schools until I was 14. Oh. And all my friends were Seventh-day Adventist. And do you think that contributed to you then, uh, quote unquote, rebelling and going off the, the path uh, that your parents have chosen for you, let's say? Uh, I'm not sure if growing up in an insular world contributed to, to my rebelling, but I tell you what, moving out of the insular world actually probably opened me up to rebellion more than staying in it. As long as I was in it, all my friends were Seventh-day Adventists, and so that was the... That was the only way I saw the world because that was all I was getting reflected back to me. Right. But, uh, but then it was inevitable that at some point you were going to find the, the outside world. And I think that happens to a lot of people that grow up in uh, kind of insulated bubbles in, in a way. And then they come out and uh, I guess if they have no ex prior exposure to that, then it's kind of hard to, uh, to reconcile the secular ideas and the, the vast... Uh, wild west of freedom compared to uh you know the strict upbringing you know well I, I think it depends on how happy people are in 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 the world that they were raised in if people are happy they're not going to leave it if people have friends in the world they were raised in they're not going to leave it but if people are unhappy then they're then then they're likely to leave and i was not happy i was not a happy kid and mm -hmm. so i was looking I was looking for happiness. I was looking for joy, and I was, I was looking for, for for everything to to try to staunch the the pain and the the, the suffering and the just the inadequate way of leading a life that I felt I had. Mm. By the way, you mentioned before sleeping on the floor. Um, I haven't heard that. Is that is that something that in that particular church was praised? Like you sleep on the floor kind to kind of build up the spirit, or uh, maybe I, I don't remember, but I just remember from my books on missionaries that they didn't usually have luxurious uh, accommodations. Because mm. I do remember some saints, also some Catholic saints, doing that. They would uh, they would try to deny themselves and sleep on the floor and stuff like that. Like, like the famous Padre Pio, for example, would sleep on the floor and. Uh, uh, but yeah, th that kind of style of denying yourself, that's uh, seen as uh, as good and challenge themselves. Right. So th there's usually an element of, of self-denial, I, I think, in, in most religions, because when you bond through through suffering, it's a, it's a powerful way of bonding with other people. So when you suffer, you you look to other people for connection and to talk about what's going on. So, I mean, I, I think all all religions place restrictions on, on people to, I don't know, to to bring about a unity, to bring about humility. I, I think uh, the, the the specific types of restrictions and and painful rituals will vary, but I think pretty much all groups, not just uh, religions, have painful rituals to enforce group bonding. Like sports, would you say that they have painful? I guess uh, there's a lot of, there can be a lot of shoving among fans as well. There's, uh, there's as, especially if the fan groups, especially in Europe, when fan groups are intense and, and, and soccer and uh, and basketball, and then they fight each other. And that's the kind of, that's painful, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and athletes, when, when they're training, they, they go through, through a lot of pain. So I think all tight in groups have, 
have painful rituals to to bond people all of them wow that's interesting well i guess even like waking up and going to uh if you have some kind of meeting or something like that when you don't feel like it that's so-called pain but it's not uh okay it's in it some small way you have to you have to make a sacrifice isn't it right right and take something that you were having for granted and take it away and be like this is my sacrifice so um when does uh your does your family then move to to united states at some point yeah we moved to the united states in 1977 so i was 11 years of age and uh so i've lived most of my life in the united states so i came here in 1977 and so i've lived about uh 43 years of, of my life, 42 years of my life total in, in the United States. I've lived about 11 years of my life in Australia. Okay. Okay. So not much time in Australia. So I feel more uh, American than Australia. Yeah, definitely by the amount of time that I've spent. Uh, on the other hand, nine of my first 11 years were in Australia. And so the, the first years in many ways are more formative. So I was just in Australia for two months and I felt very, very comfortable. I felt very much like, oh, this is my home. And I thought a great deal about moving to Sydney. And, and then I came back to America. I thought, oh, I should at least fly back to my life in Beverly Hills to, to see how I feel there. And then I, I get back to, to Beverly Hills and this feels perfectly comfortable to me too. So I, I kind of fall in love with both places. Right, right. And especially because you live there for so long, obviously, um, you're going to, your heart is there as well, let's say. Yeah, I've spent almost all my time in the U.S. in California. So yeah, yeah, yeah. California is a beautiful place to be. So in California, um, were you still a part of the uh, the father's religion, your family's religion? For a while? Yeah, from age 11 to 14, we were at a Seventh-day Adventist college, Pacific Union College in the Napa Valley. And then in 1980, my father moved out of the church and we moved about two hours north of uh, the Napa Valley. And my father set up his own non-denominational evangelical Christian foundation. And so I would occasionally get back to Pacific Union College in the Napa Valley because I had so many friends there. I loved it there. And our new, our new evangelical Christian community was still about 80, 90% of people from a Seventh-day Adventist background. But it was, it was a watered down version of community. So when I was living in, in Seventh-day Adventist college campuses, such as I was for most of my first 14 years of life, and everybody I knew was a Seventh-day Adventist. But, but now I was increasingly making friends with people outside of that fold. Well, what's the difference then between a Seventh-day Adventist uh, school and the, the other uh, public school? Oh, so many differences. So Seventh-day Adventists are vegetarian. Oh, okay. Seventh-day Adventists keep uh, the Seventh-day Sabbath. So they observe the Sabbath from sundown Friday night to sundown Saturday night. Uh, Seventh-day Adventists abstain from nicotine, alcohol, caffeine. Uh, it's a very distinctive way of life. What about so, tea? Uh, they abstain from caffeinated tea. Uh, so uh, if green tea, is green tea caffeinated? Well, some green tea is caffeinated and some is decaffeinated. Right. Okay. Because right now I'm drinking. Oh, that's why I think Mormons have similar, don't they? they yeah. don't, that's why they don't drink tea because it's uh uh could be addictive and that's why it's forbidden yeah yeah so um so then you're there and you, you make all these friends with uh, with other people and then they kind of uh, change your mind on things so perhaps you you're going to you're probably uh reading a lot because uh given that you're a writer you were probably an avid reader as well yeah so it wasn't so explicit that they were changing my mind on things it was the, the, the experience that there are all these other good ways of, of leading a life so initially mm. up until about age 18 i still thought that the way i was raised was the best way to live so i, I would experience other homes and, and other ways of living and i'd still think that my way was the best but i you start to see people outside the fold as increasingly human you, you recognize that they have the, the same complexities as the other people you've known and you, you increasingly come to terms with all these different ways of leading a life. So as long as you're, or you're, everyone you know is just Seventh-day Adventist, you don't think about any alternatives. So then you start meeting people and it's not an explicit changing of your mind. You just, 
your focus just changes and your attention changes and possibilities start start bubbling up for you that uh, that you didn't have when you're in a more insular world you know uh, there's a saying and a lot of uh, like uh, self-help uh, circles that uh, you're you're the average of the five people you hang out the most and I guess in some way because you're you actually uh, like taking in a lot of their attitudes and views on life and and so it would make total sense if you live in an insular environment for a while and then you're there and then you all your friends, all your associates are in that circle, but then you move outside and then it's totally different because you have meet different kinds of people and then then your outlook changes inevitably, right? Yeah, so I started sneaking away from the house on Friday night to go to basketball games at my school to cover them for the local newspaper. So I was now really interested in pursuing a career in journalism. And so I would tell my parents that I was going to a Bible study. Uh, <laughs> and then I just, you know, run off to the, to the high school. And so I was, I was enjoying the fruits of, of breaking the Sabbath. Right. And, and so that, that became increasingly appealing. And then I imagine your parents found out. No, they never found out. Oh, they never found out. Okay. No. I guess, <laughs> I guess they only, found, well, I guess the, um, so was it stark then they, they thought you were in the church like holy in all this you know and then all of a sudden they're like well luke is not going to church anymore <laughs> how was that how was that process well i think the first big uh, difference that they they saw was uh i went to my high school graduation which was held on a saturday mm -hmm. and, and so Oh, but, and before that, I took the SAT call, uh, test. So it's a scholastic aptitude test. And I yeah. took that on a Saturday and I could have made arrangements to take it not on a Saturday, but I just went along and did it on a Saturday. So I was already, already changing. I went to my high school graduation on a Saturday morning instead of going to church. And then uh, that night I went to my first secular party where people were drinking and I had like had some alcohol. And so the next morning when I got home at 4 a.m. and the next morning when I got up, my father says, oh, you look 10 years older. So um, so I think they were starting to get intimations. And then I went away for a year after high school. I went away to live with my brother in Australia, who's an atheist. So right. um, but that's quite a statement, I, though. Hold on, hold on. Like 10 years older, like he kind of saw he saw you right away and he, he can intuit that. Maybe you were hungover a little bit, but he can intuit maybe the the attitudes that you're holding, and he saw right away. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that made explicit things that were kind of implicit for years. Mm. And um, was it was it then hard to reconcile that with a dad being in a, in a, in the public eye, and then you? Um, because uh, obviously, obviously, there must be some pressure on the kids to kind of live up to uh, the ideal image of the family, especially if uh, the uh, the parent is is so prominent in a certain religion. Well, both my older brother and sister had rebelled, so oh, it okay. was right. it was kind of easy for me to follow in their footsteps. Like you, my my parents eventually said that I was the most compliant of all the kids while I was living at home, and then I became the biggest heartache after I left home. Oh wow! Okay, and uh, was this a source? <laughs> was that comment a, a source of uh, of of uh, like disaffirmation or like like did you like to, to hear that comment? I didn't have any strong feelings. I just recognized the truth of it. I'm not somebody who likes confrontation in his personal life, so mm -hmm. I I can't hear you. I it just went out again. Sorry. Yeah, I would code switch. Okay. So like most kids, I would speak, I would speak one way to my parents and speak in a completely different way. Once I left the house that when I was in the house, I would just instinctively obey the rules of the house. But when I left the house, I did, you know, what was whatever everyone else was doing. So while I lived at home, I conformed, because that's how I am. I don't like to confront in my personal life where I'm living. I don't want confrontation and, and drama. But then once I got out of the house, I'd do what I wanted. And I was largely able to get away with it mm. and then um would you say that conforming was one uh, one uh 
style that you maybe were grew up as a kid, but then later on the the perhaps to develop the other part of personality, as it were. This is uh, this is me just blabbering on, but um, what I think might have, might have happened is that you then to develop the other part, that the unexplored part, you became like a, a rebel against uh, the upbringing. Or would you say that's not accurate? No, I, I did completely rebel against my my upbringing. I became an atheist for four years after I moved back to Australia with my brother. At first, I was going to church. Then I got a job that required me to work on Saturday morning. And then I decided to just, you know, completely give up religion. And so I, when I came back to the States, I still lived with my parents for another uh, three years. But I, you know, I was an atheist and I didn't go to church and I didn't keep the Sabbath. And they, they didn't give me a hard time about it. They, they thought it was just a phase that I was going through. Mm. Yeah, there's something to be said about the, the, the love of parents. They try to, I mean, life is so hard in a way and to have, to have parents there and uh, and obviously if they try to dissuade you every day and try to convince you that wouldn't uh they knew that that wouldn't work probably right. at all right so right. uh they did they did uh, they probably did the best they could at the time um so then uh how does the the blogging then start well initially i, I wanted a career in in the mainstream news media I that that was my my goal since eighth grade. I wanted to be a journalist, but when I was when I was uh, twenty one in the in February of nineteen eighty eight, I got really sick, and so I tried to continue on with my life. I, I went to UCLA for a year, but I was I was sick the whole time, and so I was eventually bedridden for six years with something that doctors call chronic fatigue syndrome, and it it stayed with me essentially ever since then. It just uh, I, I got partial relief after six years. And I, I only really overcame it about six months ago. I've been a lifelong vegetarian because that's what Seventh-day Adventists do. But I took these uh, grass-fed beef organ capsules about six months ago, and it suddenly I just felt amazing. And, and the, the fatigue that had dogged me for almost all my life just disappeared. So I don't know why. It was just such a night and, night and day experience of uh, taking these, these mm. beef organ capsules. So I finally... Uh, six months ago, finally I overcame the chronic fatigue syndrome. But anyway, that that severely restricted my life. And so I started looking for work that I, I could do from home. And so I thought I'd write a book. And I thought, oh, I'll write a book on the history of sex and film. Mm -hmm. And then I developed thousands of pages of notes. And someone said, oh, you should put up a blog and put, you know, porn banner ads along all, all the, the writing that you've done. And so... I did that and I was able to start making my living from that. And so I was able to make my living as a blogger from 1997 to 2007. Now I could only do it by writing on the most salacious topics possible. So blogging right. about the, the porn industry and some aspects of Hollywood and the, the overall sex industry. But I, I loved that I could work from home and th that I had, you know, tremendous uh, freedom. So that's how I got into blogging. And then because you know, I was blogging about the porn industry and uh, didn't always observe uh, good journalistic uh, protocols, and you know, I made some major mistakes. I, I, I also some enemies. Yeah, I made a lot of enemies. I, I oh. got sued five times for libel, and and I, I diminished my ability to ever get a a job in in the regular news media. The lawsuits. Also, did you lose yeah. any of them? Uh, no. So. Uh, there was one one case that my insurance company settled, but uh, the other ones, other ones I, I won. But it's still, still not a pleasant experience. But anyway, I I fell in love with blogging because I could just say what I wanted without the restrictions of an editor, without thinking about the repercussions of what I'm going to say to the right. rest of the the staff. And so, just I think temperamentally, as a, as a rebellious type, I'm particularly well suited to blogging. Hmm. And um, you decided to write on the pornography because I'm guessing at the time you were using pornography. So you naturally thought this is interesting. And also a lot of people naturally, no, not, not I shouldn't say naturally. I just say they, they are interested in pornography. So, and you saw it as, as, a, as a way of uh, making a living, I suppose. 
yeah, I was interested in it, uh, but it was also the, the only topic that I could make a living writing about. So it, it was, you know, it's very difficult to, to write for a living. And this was a topic that uh, galvanized tremendous attention. And so I'd have 10,000, 15,000 readers a day. What would you write about, though? Can I ask? Like, Well, I'd interview the people in the industry and how, how did they get there? And so people had, had fascinating stories to tell. And uh, in many ways, these were among the most honest people I'd met because they were outside polite society. And so they didn't have to observe the, the norms of polite society. And so they could say, they could say some very funny uh, truths, which I really appreciated. Also, there was an organized crime element in the industry. So I, I wrote a great deal about that. Uh, the economics of the industry, uh, the industry often led the way in technological change. Mm -hmm. So I'd write about that and uh, law enforcement's attitude towards the industry because the industry dwelt in kind of a gray area between the legal and the clearly illegal. So there were endless things to write about. Well, wow. so and then you, did you also um, make... I suppose it make uh, if you cover something for so long, you made friends in the industry, and uh, did you ever uh, get like almost like a, uh, not involved, but I suppose you were not involved, but uh, just uh, you know, one <laughs> first person close up view of what's go what goes on, and uh, as someone that just tries to stay away from it. Um, I can see the lure of it, you know, the lure of trying to, especially if you're reporting on something like this. And uh, so what was your relationship with the, the people in the industry at the time? Uh, my, my relationship was, was fairly distant. So none of them were in my real life. So this was, this was a topic that I wrote about. So I used to cover the San Francisco 49ers uh, National Football League team. And so I would the training camp was at my college that, that I went to. And so I would go to the camp. I'd interview the players. I'd interview the coach. I'd go to press conferences. I, I went to games. And so for me, this was just like covering any other uh, team or, or group or, or journalistic beat. So I would, uh, I'd go to events. I, I'd go to filmings. I would uh, make arrangements to, to interview people but I didn't bring anyone into my real life. What do you think about the effect of pornography on people? I think it, it varies. So some people can, can uh, dabble in pornography without any observable harm. Uh, some people even seem to flourish in the porn industry. Mm -hmm. uh, most people seem to be damaged by it. Uh, I think it probably has a negative effect on, on most people who dabble in it. But not, but not some all. People it's, some people it's devastating hmm. who uh so the people that flourish you mean the the uh, the actors the producers in the industry themselves yeah some some actors uh, some producers some directors some business people some sales people in the industry seem to be enjoying flourishing lives so i can't can't tell you that everybody in the industry is absolutely miserable because that that wasn't what i saw right right but so would you say that they actually like also well-adjusted individuals that uh, despite their profession, they have somehow um, kept their feet on the ground. They're not the drug addicts. They're not, uh, let's say, morally reprehensible. And they're just uh, a regular citizen, except they have an odd job. Yeah, some people, you, you could not point out any obvious pathology. And uh, some people- <laughs> I like say, that. <laughs> Yeah, obvious pathology but, yeah so people are complicated so i know people want to just paint like everyone is in the industry is evil and uh, messed up and that wasn't what i saw so plenty of people were messed up but plenty of people they found recovery from drugs and alcohol in the industry because they found a a family they found a substitute community and a lot of people got sober in in the industry for a lot of people uh, working in the industry was an improvement on what they were doing before. Oh, like uh, like Hitman or something? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, what they were doing before, what like what? Well, some people were drug addicts and alcoholics prior to entering the industry, and in the industry they got sober. 
and they improve their lives. Right. Um, and I suppose a lot of people then, not only actors, but people that watch it get uh, get destroyed uh, inside and, and then outside as well, like observable, observably destroyed. Right. I, I can hear you. And we're back. Yeah. So uh, there was a lot of talk in the industry about porn years. So like one porn year is equal to five regular years. So oh man, the, the industry would take a lot of a lot of a toll uh, on people. And so uh, people would age, and uh, you know, some people would commit suicide. But I'm not sure that the suicide rate in the porn industry was higher than say among dentists. I think dentists have a really high uh, suicide rate. So. Definitely some people, many people dramatically deteriorated in the industry. And then for the user, uh, it can it can trigger, you know, can trigger despair. It can trigger, you know, alienation from other people. I think it tends to to warp your your mental processes. So you get the this overwhelming dopamine hit and it, it tends to hijack your thinking processes which then interfere with your ability to interact with people in, in normal life. So it, it, it increases the isolation that at first it was, it was the cure for. You know, people feel isolated and alone. They look at porn, they feel good. But then looking at porn often traps them into a downward spiral that leads to increasing isolation and difficulty interacting with other people. Yeah, yeah. And... and uh... Yeah, visibly, like I seem, it seems to be morally or ethically, a lot of things are problematic with, with the porn industry. Like, what was your? Because my experience with it as, uh, and also I saw some studies actually. Um, this is not so much my experience. I maybe a little bit, but I saw credible studies saying that uh, a use of porn is is related to uh, uh, like what they call porn induced erectile dysfunction even among young people, like in their 20s. And I've read online some horror stories about people that have uh, overused it and, you know, masturbated uh, many, many times in a day. To, uh, it's, it's, oh man, the horror stories are truly horrendous. It makes me kind of sick, you know? <laughs> right, but the, the horror stories come from people, generally speaking, with, with an empty life who were so intoxicated by pornography because it, it filled that that hole in their soul. So people who are that despairing, that isolated, and that lonely, uh, they're wide open for something to come along and and to mess them up even more. Now, my, my focus was not primarily on the, the effect of pornography on the user. I'm sure a lot of people have done studies on that. Yeah. My my focus was on the people who made it. And when I was in the industry, one of the benefits of being around the industry is that it basically killed my own attraction to pornography. So oh. while while I'd had at times, you know, an overwhelming uh, attraction to the product, once I started writing about it, that that was vitiated. Mm. Like what, like what, what, what made you turn away from porn? It wasn't, so you're saying it wasn't the effect it had on you personally watching, but that you saw how it was made and people like, what made you turn off, turn it off? Well, if anyone sees how anything that they love is made is going to, you know, probably reduce their, their attraction for it. So once you start to know, once you start to know the individuals who are in the, the porn, they're, they're no longer erotic objects. It's like, oh, you know, I know that woman. Um, I, I know these people. And oh, so okay. it makes it much more difficult to eroticize people that you know. And then just just being around the industry and interviewing people, I just felt this growing sense of just like disgust and wanted absolutely nothing to to do with the industry aside from what I needed for writing my blog and earning my living. Okay, so it wasn't so for you, it wasn't the watching. It was actually you saw the you got a feeling from the covering the industry itself, which is interesting. And then, but then. Why? Why is it then that now that you're not covering it years later, you still have because you don't know the people that are doing it now. So one could argue by that logic, you don't know the people, so you could 
potentially enjoy it more now because you have no relationship with those people now. Uh, right. So I just uh, had a realization in, in 2011, uh, no more porn. And, and uh, I, needed, I needed some emotional sobriety. So I started attending 12-step programs. Some of them had a uh, you know, strong component of uh, porn addiction. And for me, emotional sobriety became a top, top goal. And I just didn't want to, just didn't want to contaminate myself with, with the filth anymore. So th there are right. a lot of things that I started dropping from my life. I mean, there are even, there are TV shows that I won't watch. I, I can't tell you in advance, but I mean, I was able to watch Game of Thrones and it didn't affect my emotional sobriety, but th there are other TV shows that, that uh, I, I would feel affecting my sobriety. So I would stop watching them. Okay, so that's, uh, I feel like that's a pretty uh, uh, honorable thing to do, uh, to avoid uh, temptations. I, uh, I don't know how much you know about Billy Graham, but I heard somewhere it said there was a documentary that he would even avoid, because uh, he was so, uh, obviously so famous, uh, the temptation would be any, everywhere. So he would avoid being in the same room uh, with any woman other than his wife. So, <laughs> yeah, that, so that, that's Mike Pence. Mike Pence won't uh, have oh, Mike have Pence a as meal. well, I guess. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. He won't have a meal with, with any, any woman unless there are other people present. Yeah. And I guess that's uh, in some, I guess uh, that would, uh, that would save some people some, you know, some heartache and uh, some potential lawsuits and whatnot. But yeah, and, and for me, I wasn't thinking about it in terms of temptation. It was just that I like every part of my day to build profitably on, on the previous. So normally I get up at about 5.30 a.m., I have a cold shower, I take a, a protein drink, I listen to a 12-step phone meeting, I have sponsees that I talk to, I do various uh, physical procedures to locate and release unnecessary tension in my body. And so by the time usually I start working about 8 a.m., I am free in body, mind, and soul. Like I, I've, I abstain from, usually from checking my email or checking the news or checking social media for the first two and a half hours of, of my day. So I like to get off to a really clean start. And then I like, I like everything to build on top of each other rather than contradict or undercut. So I, I know many people I talk to after they eat a meal, they get sleepy. Well, I, I, I never experienced that because I, I eat meals with, with plenty of protein. So if you have a high carb meal, you're going to get sleepy. But if you eat a high protein meal, you're not going to get sleepy. So I want my meals to complement the rest of my life. I do a lot of live streams, but I don't do live streams that are going to undercut and, and damage and destroy the rest of my life off camera. So when I'm speaking publicly, I calibrate what I'm saying so that it fits in with the rest of my life. So that, you know, when I go to synagogue, when I go to work, when I go to a 12 step meeting, when I'm watching TV, when I'm reading a book, when I'm making uh, a video, when I'm writing a blog post, I want everything to work together rather than to work against each other. So whether it's the, the food I eat, the music I listen to, what I watch, uh, how I spend my spare time, who I hang out with, where I go and what I do, I want all of them to work together rather than working against each other. Right. And you mentioned synagogue. So how did you go from being an atheist to uh, converting to a different religion? Right. So when I was an atheist, I got really sick. And that threw me into an existential crisis because my life was, was built on all the great things that I wanted to do. And now I wasn't able to do anything. So... Hold on. Do you think there was any... Um... Do you think there was any like uh, thing you, you might have done at the time? Or do you think there was some uh, kind of uh, faded that you would be sick? Uh, well, uh, take, I think the, the vegetarian diet that I was on uh, right. left, left me wide open for health problems. I think a, a purely vegetarian diet is damaging. And I think the, the studies about the effects of a vegetarian diet is that are not funded by people with a pro-vegetarian bias make it pretty clear that the vegetarian diet is, is damaging for your health. So the, uh, you know, I was you raised... think for all people or more, maybe some people are not. Cause I had a, I had a one time, I uh, knew this girl that told me she was vegetarian for six years. And then she's like, then she, uh, she ate meat one, one day and her, she felt like her body was like, Ooh, I want this. But uh, a lot of, uh, 
I have, I know I have vegan friends and they would never admit to this. You know, they would be like, oh, you know, we can, we can survive on vegan diets, but maybe not everybody's meant to survive on that. Yeah. I think vegetarian diet is damaging. I think it's bad for you. And it, uh, it strangled my life. You know, I was deprived of the opportunity to have, have a normal life by the vegetarian diet that I was raised with. It, uh, it precipitated all sorts of problems. So vegetarians right. are particularly susceptible to depression, to fatigue, uh, to stunted uh, cognitive development. Mm. Uh, I, I think it's it's a, a crazy, crazy diet. And so th that uh, left me wide open for all these problems that, that stunted my life. Now, I forgot what was the... Oh, the, the, the synagogue, the, the synagogue and the, uh, you know, uh, then you convert it from being an atheist to becoming converting to another religion. Right. So my world had fallen apart. And so I was looking for a way out of something that was beyond my ability to understand. I had no idea why I was so sick and, and the months and years would roll by and I wasn't getting any relief. So when I was sick, I wasn't able to read as much because of headaches. So I listened to a lot of talk radio and there was a talk radio host named Dennis Prager, who I started listening to regularly. And I formed a very strong attachment to him and I'd call in and hit to his show and I'd oh. debate with him and I, I really appreciated him and his show. So I ended up reading some books that he'd written, which were on Judaism. And then I'd met Jews for the first time at UCLA and became highly intrigued. And uh, so I just started reading. So it began as a, an intellectual journey. Then I got to know many, many Jews and I, I really liked uh, their way of life. Wow. And so... So it was Dennis Prager that started you on that journey, basically. Yes. Nice. Yes. Okay. I think some of you, uh, some listeners, some viewers were will know Dennis Prager. And um, so you just went on. You, you had the the interest, the inclination to go, and you met uh, you met a lot of Jewish people, and then and then it started to grow in you the desire. Why why not me? Why not me? I'm sorry, why not me? I don't understand. Become Jewish. Oh, well, I, I became intellectually interested. I became socially connected. Mm -hmm. And it just seemed like a, a good way of life. And I, I became convinced that this was a, a profound uh, approach to living. I was just fascinated by all the Jewish books I was reading. And so I started making steps towards uh, conversion because I, I was also convinced that I, I was in need of community. When I was sick, I was particularly isolated and I didn't feel like I could go back to the Seventh-day Adventism that I was raised in. I, I didn't have any desire for that. And so I needed community. And so I, I reached out to, to the Jewish community, made friends, began my conversion process and uh, passed my conversion in 1993. Mm. But was this a long process? Well, it was 1989 that I decided to convert. So it was about four years later till okay. I finally finished the process. Is it true that I've heard stories when I was in Israel that uh, other religions, when you want to convert, they're like, yeah, yeah, come. But Judaism is like, no, you know, maybe, maybe not. Maybe. And then you have to come three or four times and they're like, okay, okay. You want to do this? <laughs> Yeah, they, they definitely tend to discourage converts because from, from a Jewish perspective, there's no need for anyone to convert, that they're just fine as they are, that all good people have a place in the world to come. And it's also a way of testing and, and winnowing out those who aren't going to be a good fit. So some rabbis who in charge of conversion programs, Orthodox rabbis have told me that 99% of the people they meet who want to convert are mentally ill. So generally speaking, people who convert from one religion to another are going to be quite high in neuroticism. Uh, there's, there's usually going to be something, something off because people often to seek like to make a religious change uh, to try to get rid of psychic pain. And, and I'm sure that that played, played a role in, in my life as well. But um, I, it's largely a matter of can you fit into the community? That's that's probably a major criteria of the people who oversee the conversion process. So first of all, they discourage, and then then they start to slowly admit and to test and to see whether you can fit in with the community. And 
but my mm. personality turned out to be a good fit with the Jewish community. Meaning that I, I know Jewish community has uh, the way they study the faith is very uh, intellectual, and perhaps that is why um, a lot of, uh, particularly Israeli citizens, they they uh, there's a lot of Nobel Prize winners that are Jewish and all that. So, seem do you think it's directly related to the way the religion uh, studies itself, the way the way it's taught to people? I think it's much more that the religion is a reflection of the DNA of the people who participate in it. So let's say the divine revelation had been given to a different tribe, a tribe with very different uh, proclivities, uh, then I think the religion would have developed very differently. But high IQ people want intellectual stimulation, and uh, low IQ people are not capable of uh, intellectual stimulation. So I think... I think it's the particular people that, that produce a, a culture. And so mm. even if you believe in the traditional conception that God gave the Torah to a particular people, uh, the particular people are going to have a profound effect on how the Torah is studied and discussed and interpreted and implemented. So I think there's DNA, which produces culture, and then a subset of culture is religion. So for example, um, West African Christianity is very different from European Christianity. Right. American Christianity is very different from Australian Christianity. So the culture has a tremendous effect on the religion. And I think religions spring out of particular cultures, which are primarily formed by some combination of, of DNA and geography, DNA and environment. But don't you think that, uh, that Europe throughout centuries of being Christian was changed because of the, the religion? I think I, we're seeing that now with... Uh, a large part of Africa is, is Christian and some is Muslim. And those are the two, either Protestant or Catholic, whatever. But let's just say Christian and, 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 and Islam. Those are the two predominant religions. And I think it's changing the continent, mostly for the best, for the best. And also, I think the, the culture of Europe and the culture of the United States has been massively impacted by the Judeo-Christian philosophy. You know, throughout the century, you know, everybody is so many people being religious and all that. I think it, I don't know if it if it's the DNA of the people or perhaps it's the philosophy of the religion itself that then has the impact long term on the whole populace. Well, a good way of testing that is to look at Scandinavia. So Scandinavia is the first secular societies the world has ever seen. And they came out of the the, the Protestant Scandinavian ethic. And so you can look at like life results in Scandinavia. Scandinavia is, you know, 98% secular and people have the same length of life. You know, people lead very similar lives, even though they're now secular as opposed to when they're religious. So I think uh, Christianity doesn't have much of an effect on most of its nominal adherents. It's a, it's a, you know, a communal and a cultural thing to do until it becomes a communal and cultural thing uh, not to do. But I think uh, Christianity is uh, highly flexible and it will adapt to all sorts of different circumstances. And I think it's much more changed by the culture that it's operating in than it's changing the culture. Mm. Well, well, you think uh, Judaism is more... Um, uh... Judaism is pretty much the, the same way. So okay. l let's say you had... A, you had a bunch of uh, converts to, to Judaism with a particular DNA and particular proclivities, that's going to have a profound effect on how they, they practice Judaism. So Judaism and Christianity and pretty much and Islam are profoundly affected by the cultures that they operate in. So Southeast Asian Islam is completely different from Middle Eastern Asian Islam. You right. don't find terrorists coming out of uh, Thailand, uh, to, the, to the best of my knowledge. So like just knowing that someone's Christian or Jewish or Muslim doesn't really tell you anything. If you find out that they're Ashkenazi, Jewish, you know, Lithuanian for five generations, that tells you something. Uh, if you hear that someone's Muslim doesn't tell you anything, but if you hear they're Muslim and Thai, then, then you get, you know, a more, more precise reading on people. It, it, Thailand, isn't that mostly Buddhist though? That's mostly Buddhist country, no? I, I'm not sure. I'm okay. just using... Yeah, that is a Southeast Asian country. So to right, me, right. there are plenty of Muslims in Southeast Asia, but they're of a completely different quality than, say, Muslims from Saudi oh, yeah. Arabia or Iran. 
you know, uh, I grew up in a, in a country that's uh, Slovenia, that's maybe three or 4% Muslim. And I had never seen somebody, I don't know what you call when, when a woman is in full, uh, a hijab. Uh, hijab, full, full body type thing. Yeah. The, the only time, uh, the first time I saw it when, when I moved to London and that's where I right. saw it because the Muslims in Slovenia moved from Bosnia and Bosnian Muslims have been there for centuries. So they're very much more Europeanized, but the Muslims that come to to UK are the Muslims from the Middle East. So that's quite a bit different. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. obviously, yeah, the Muslims in, in Slovenia, a completely different uh, group culturally from, from the Muslims in London. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned 12 subgroups and all that, uh, which is, uh, I think AA is one of the, the famous examples. Uh, did that uh, in any way, um, change the way you practice Judaism? Well, I, I think one of the reasons that I converted to Judaism was to try to get get control of my unruly self. And I was looking kind of for, for relief from an unwanted self, like, like many people who convert. And, and then I realized as the years went by that the that, that Judaism as I was practicing it anyway was not doing that. It wasn't really affecting my moral character. So I only found emotional sobriety and, and relief from any of my more imperious and antisocial urges from 12-step programs. So by attaining emotional sobriety through 12-step through programs, I was then able to, to come to Judaism and to participate in the Jewish community a lot more easily. So I was creating less ruckus in the Jewish community. I was creating less turbulence. I was alienating fewer people. I was able to fit in. I was able to let go of more of my ego. I used to have this character trait. I probably still do to varying extent, but I used to have this character trait where I wanted to take over every group that I ever joined. Like I thought I was smarter than everyone. And like I would go to Torah classes and I would ask questions to try to make the rabbi look stupid. And that alienated me from a lot of people. And, and I, I operated that way for gosh, the first 25 years in Judaism and just made all sorts of unnecessary enemies and just made myself unwanted in, in many places. So once I was able to obtain some emotional sobriety and see to the extent to which my own choices and my own behavior was responsible for my problems, uh, I was able to kind of let go of the chip on my shoulder against you know this person or that, that community in, in Judaism. And I learned to get along with people. And so it made my my Jewish life much happier and, and smoother. Yeah, it's like, um, seems like self-centeredness is the, the key to, to a lot of troubles because I have found myself uh, that, uh, uh, particularly I observe it in myself in, in the last three years more so than any other time because I became more, in a way, more, more confident in myself, but also I, I noticed that I've been, also extremely irritated when people disagree with me in some way and i would get quite uh sometimes quite hostile and stuff like that so i'm like hmm this is quite strange so and then i noticed that some other people they they didn't have that they were quite um yeah quite more easygoing because most of the time i'm easygoing but except when it comes to things that I'm passionate about or things that I strongly have a vested interest. And I'm like, Oh, I think this is right. And you're, I'm right. And you're wrong. And, but, the, but then I, I found 99.9% .9 of the time, if I, if I do express it and especially in the strongest terms that this, this is not conducive to anything good usually. Yeah. So I just would build up all these resentments against other people and women that I dated and, and you know, rabbis that I'd had uh, falling out with. And uh, I just, just built up all, all these resentments and then things would spiral into rejection. I would get, you know, increasingly rejected for, because of my, my antisocial behavior. And, and then the 12 step approach I found incredibly helpful, surprisingly, because I'd always dismissed it. I'd always thought it was really, gay and stupid, that it was, you know, people who weren't strong enough to take responsibility. But right. I, I came to appreciate the 12-step approach of, you know, you didn't choose to be a sex addict or you didn't choose to be a debtor 
or you didn't choose to be an alcoholic, right? You didn't choose these things. Therefore, you don't have to beat yourself down for the, you know, the ugly things that I've done, say, pursuing, you know, intense sexual and, and romantic uh, interactions. Like, you know, I've got a whole, a whole history of some ugly behavior, and I don't have to hate myself for that behavior. I have a moral obligation to make amends where appropriate, but I didn't choose to be a sex and love addict. I, I didn't choose to have these, these various crippling emotional addictions. So therefore, I was, didn't have to beat myself down for them. So, so I was able to be more emotionally level because I, I no longer needed to beat myself down. And I was able to accept my role in, in my own misery without beating myself down for my, my bad behavior. So if I don't have to denigrate myself, it makes it easier for me to see the role that I've played in, in my own suffering and in other people's suffering. And it, it was just, uh, it, was, it surprised me with an approach that just pragmatically worked. It, it, it enabled me to see more and more and more of my own role in interactions with, with other people and to see you know, where I'm being compulsive and, and where I'm you know, operating with, you know, with blinders on and, mm. and where I'm getting out of touch with, with reality. So. So the twelve-step approach helped me to uh, accept more and more of reality. And w when you don't accept reality, you get humiliated. So every time I get humiliated, I re recognize, okay, what part of reality am I missing? For example, I I was missing a bus, and then if I'd done more preparation to see where the bus stop was, I, I wouldn't have had that problem. So when when I get humiliated, it's a lot easier for me to now think, okay, wh what part of reality was I in denial of? Wh what part of reality was I not accepting? Uh, you know, where, where was I exhibiting a lack of consideration for, for myself, for other people, for, for important details? Mm. And one, um, there, there's a philosopher like uh, Eric Hoffer that uh, mostly lived in California in later years of his life and got to noble, uh, not noble, to, uh, what's the highest prize in American uh, presidential medal of freedom right presidential medal of freedom from ron reagan and he said that uh, even if you're i'm paraphrasing that even if you're really observant uh sensitive and uh, you know person that uh, somebody that's not sensitive can be more observant of you than you are of yourself so i really like that that quote because it signifies that other people also have they're very much perceptive more than you are of yourself so how so I guess when you, what I'm trying to say is when you went through a change, particularly maybe with Judaism first and then 12 steps, what, what, what were the, some of the things people would say when you converted to Judaism and then later on when you start really actively working the 12 steps, particularly with a sponsor? I remember one thing that people would say is that you're always trying to show off how smart you are. And, and when you're asking questions at, at a Torah class, you're not asking to, to learn something. You're you're asking to try to advance yourself and to put other people down. So uh, Jewish community is very, tends to be very intense and very close knit. So yeah, I got a lot of, a lot of feedback where, you know, I was saying inappropriate things and at inappropriate times to inappropriate people. And I was just riding roughshod over other people, you know, generally speaking in, in the, in the pursuit of, you know, women and, it was kind of uh, ugly and and embarrassing and uh, right. and yeah, I just developed a really bad slutty reputation, which is not a good reputation to have within Orthodox Judaism. So I was kind of ill at ease with myself and ill at ease with other people. And people would ask me things like, you know, who are you mad at? Because you know I would explode and I would get angry, uh, far disproportionate to the reality of the situation. And so the 12 step work helped me to come to terms with, you know, whatever gripes I had against, you know, my upbringing or, or my father or you know, the, the bad luck that I felt like life had delivered me. Mm. So would you say that you have uh, forgiven your father, your, your, your parents, your, you know, your upbringing the way it was? I feel like I, I'm more at peace. I mean, there, there may be things that I, I'm still missing. You know, I still have, have a lot of blind spots and I may you know, realize later today that I still got a resentment about something. 
but uh, I feel like I'm, I'm more at peace with reality. Mm. Um, I think another thing that uh, I know that you did for a while, or at least we're learning to, was uh, was was a somatic uh, uh, healing. Was it a healing technique or um... the Alexander technique? Yes, the Alexander technique, right? So yeah, it has a it has a healing component, but it's primarily an, an educational process to help you notice the things that you're doing. And to let go of the things that aren't serving you. So, for example, many people, when they're speaking about intense things like I'm speaking about right now, they'll get all sorts of weird muscular holding patterns in their face. Like right. they, they might start developing, you know, a twitch in their forehead, or you know, their eyes might start blinking, or their lips might get really tight, their voice might get strangled, they, they may have difficult difficulty breathing, their, their shoulders might get tight. They might start tipping back from their hips and and compressing their, their lower back. They might start you know holding in their ankles, and they might start locking their knees. So, the Alexander technique is a way of, of noticing the things that we do that interfere with our best functioning. So, the Alexander technique it's an educational and awareness technique to notice the things that you're doing that are getting in your way that are inhibiting you from your your best functioning. Mm-hmm. and then learning to let them go. So if you were talking to me prior to the Alexander technique, I would have a lot more muscular tension. I'd have, you know, much more forward head posture like this. Um, I, you know, probably have one shoulder higher than the other shoulder. I'd have a lot more physical pain. And, and then all that, that pain and contraction, that then feeds back into your emotions and your thinking. So when, you, when your body's tight, your thinking and your emotions tend to be, you know, much more tight and, and volatile. Right. But when you're at ease in your body, then you can be much more at ease in your thinking and in your emotions, and you can see more possibilities than when you're just tight. You know, when you're tight, it just just confines your your thinking. Yeah, it seems like uh, the mind body connection is so very strong that uh, that's you you can notice when somebody is. Uh, I don't know if it's an intuition or or if it's but you notice the body or if it's both because you people always get a sense if somebody's really uncomfortable you know yeah. i don't but i don't i think it mostly me I, I have a my hypothesis is that it's mostly an intuition mostly like people just people especially women women can look at somebody and they're like oh this guy's bad news so this guy is uh, this really uh, shy or really uncomfortable like or, you know, some people are good at reading people like they would just see you in the way, maybe the way you walk or something. They will just see, are you the type, this type of person? Because they've seen so many, like, uh, especially security people and stuff like that. They will pick up on these things right away. So that seems physical. But then what you're talking about is, is mental. So it would seem that it stems from the mental. However, if you adjust the physical, then it also seems to adjust the mental as well. So it's an interesting uh, connection that it has. Right. The mind and the mental processes are part of the body. The mind is not separate from the body and the emotions are also part of the body. So all these things are part of the same whole. They're not separate. So whatever you're feeling is happening in your body. And so if your body's tight, that's then going to affect your, your feelings and it's going to produce certain feelings. Uh, your thinking is happening within your body. So if you've got a severe toothache, that's going to profoundly affect your thinking. Or if you've got an ingrown toenail, that's going to affect your thinking. So they're all affecting each other because they're all part of the, the same human being. So your emotions are going to affect how your body is aligned and your thinking is going to affect how your body is aligned. So if I sense a threat, like if we got into a very volatile argument right now, I would feel um, an inclination to tighten and to compress and, and to kind of go into some version of fight or flight. So I remember there was one time I did an interview with someone who, who wanted to get rid of every Jew in, in the world. And so that was the only time after an interview that I had like stomach pain. That was the one time, you know, even, even though I've studied the Alexander technique, my, my <laughs> right. stomach still tightened up and started hurting me during, during that interview. Uh, so my stomach pain or what's going on in my back or my face or my neck, that's going to affect my thinking and my emotions. My, my emotions are going to affect my thinking and my body. So they're all constantly affecting each other. Right, right. Um, 
yeah i would feel i felt like that also sometimes on back in the day when when i used to debate online i remember there was this one girl from i'll never forget this from maryland and we used to debate in 2008 about prior to the election and every day i'd come and i'd put these carefully constructed arguments and i'd <laughs> i'd have this terrible stomach pain while i was doing it you know <laughs> but i was enjoying it at the same time it's kind of you kind of get the you kind of get a secret payoff out of that. Otherwise, you wouldn't be doing it, I think. Yeah, you can enjoy something and also be hurting yourself at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you're an author of five books. Uh, I wrote it down. So it's uh, one is called A History of X, and one is called Access uh, Communicated, A Rebel Without a Show. What, what does show mean? That's synagogue. Okay. And yesterday's news, uh, tomorrow's... Uh, and then what's the title of that book sorry <laughs> yeah so my first book was a history of x 100 years of sex and film yeah i came out in 1999 then in 2004 i published three books one was a memoir of my life in los angeles called excommunicated rebel without a shul mm. then i also published a book on movie producers called uh, the producers profiles in frustration and i also published a book on american jewish journalism called Yesterday's news tomorrow inside American Jewish journalism. And then in 2006, I published a series of, of vignettes called uh, Profiles in Sex, Love and Death. That's amazing. Not many people in the world have written five books that you have. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot of work. So I haven't, haven't produced any since 2006. But isn't the market changing as well? Like you used to, if you wrote a book back in the day, like I think 80s, they would they would sell a lot more than now because now there's uh, the attention is between books and TikTok, Facebook, <laughs> you know, Netflix. Yeah. People are divided by that. Not you know, less readers. Yeah, I, I, think. I do a lot more videos than than and no no writing of books in the last 15 years. Yeah um so uh do you still use the alexander technique yeah i still uh teach uh, the alexander technique mainly to actors and it's also something that i, I use for my own well-being not anybody that uh, you would want to mention no no you can't that, that would be <laughs> but uh no it's great i've gotten to work with actors who are on broadway actors in network tv shows of Got to work with uh, billionaires. I've got to work with uh, celebrities. It's uh, it's interesting. It's a it's an elite profession. You get to meet some interesting, highly accomplished people. Because three types of people take Alexander Technique lessons. There are those who take it for pain, because they've got interfering muscular tension and compression patterns. There are those who take it for a high level of performance, such as actors, public speakers, and then there are those who take it for personal growth. They just want to learn more about how how they're operating in ways that they're getting in their own way. So mm. it attracts, it attracts a high quality of, of person. Nice. Well, would you say it's uh, has similarities to, I once interviewed a, uh, a woman that does Feldenkrais technique. I, I'm sure there are similarities. I just don't know much about Feldenkrais. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, if people are, so I guess you're not doing this uh, via zoom or something that people have to be there right no i i do teach okay. it sometimes via zoom particularly cool. during the pandemic so people can contact you for that yeah um cool um is there anything you'd like to add before we uh we part yeah so my alexander technique website is alexander 90210.com so in, in beverly hills then uh, my, my website's uh, lukeford.net.net. And then I've got a couple of YouTube channels, Luke Ford live streams, and uh, Luke is back. So I'll, I'll put all these in, in uh, the description as well. Um, right. And last thing, uh, this doesn't have to be too long, but uh, since you mentioned Dennis Prager, uh, I'm guessing that changed the political, uh, maybe you're not political before, but uh, Dennis Prager as um, is famously on the right. So have you uh, maintained that political uh, position? Yeah, I, I am on the right. So I think I'm just biologically, temperamentally predisposed to right-wing politics. Sure. So 
though I disagree with with Dennis about many things because, uh, like everyone else, he's he's profoundly affected by the profession that he's in. So as a talk radio host, the easiest way to get and keep an audience is to agitate them and infuriate them and say, "Hey, you're being screwed over by the elites," and you know I'm fighting for you. So I've come to a much more skeptical view of talk radio than I used to have. Right, but then if you did. Um... So you think that if you did the same job as he does, that you'd have a similar position because of the incentive inherent in your position? I, I think it would profoundly affect me. I mean, whatever job you do, you're going to be affected by it. That's, that's very interesting. So I'd like to think that I wouldn't, wouldn't say many of the, like he was very dismissive of COVID. And I think he's just consistently wrong about COVID. Uh, so I'd like to think that I wouldn't take some of his... Uh, uh, less intelligent positions, but uh, uh, under the pressure of, of keeping ratings, like who knows what, what crazy things would escape my mouth. <laughs> what, what, what do you, would you say is your, your position then on COVID since you brought it up? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's serious. And I think that there are some, some issues where the elite are much more right than the populace. And so I think with regard to COVID, that the elite are more right than the populace, that the left has been more right than the right that, that uh, this is something that calls for big government and, and government intervention and intrusion and, and you know, right-wing themes of, you know, freedom and, you know, just let the people do what they want uh, are not, not an effective way of dealing with something like, like COVID. So some circumstances, I think the populists are right and the elites are wrong. So immigration restriction in Europe and in the United States is a populist position, and I think that's the, the right position. Right. Uh, affirmative action. That's an elite position uh, rejected by by populists. So I think the populists are right on, on many things, but the elite are right on many things and the populists are wrong. Well, what, what do you think about the, the COVID vaccines uh, that uh, that makes them uh, your position that you think is right, that they should everybody should take it? Yeah, I think everybody should should get vaccinated, meaning the the vaccines approved for use in the United States have proved to be highly effective at reducing hospitalization and death. They don't necessarily reduce infection significantly, it depends, but they certainly reduce death rates and hospitalization rates. So mm -hmm. I think governments should incentivize people to get vaccinated. Incentivize, but not force. I'm not sure on that. <laughs> okay. Well, that, that's probably the only thing I would uh, in this podcast disagree with you because I've had also, full disclosure, I've had other guests on that have um, would disagree strongly with your position on this. But, you know, I, I have to say as well, I don't know. I'm, um, I'm like, you know, I'm not 100% sure of my position on this. So I, I, I don't know, you know, I'm just skeptical of it and, and I, don't, I, don't, I don't need it. So I'm not, I'm not going to take it. Okay. <laughs> I like that <laughs> the way you said okay <laughs> all right cool um look forward everybody I really enjoyed the podcast with you thank yes, you for being uh, good on. to talk to you absolutely and thank you everybody for listening or watching the podcast